I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Ishan Swaroop. Um, he joined us last fall as the ninth, <clears throat> the ninth surgeon on our service. Um, he's based in Oakland, um, but has come across the Bay. Um, he's an East Bay man, which I think was good for us in getting him because we're lucky to have him. Um, he's been to all the right places, um, including we wanted him here for residency, but he picked HSS, but it's okay, he's back. And then he went to CHOP for um, his fellowship. And I don't need to say um, anything more about Ishan um, so that he can talk um, more than what Jack Flynn, my equivalent at CHOP said, which is that he is the best fellow he's ever had. Um, and already in his um, short time with us, he is um, living up to that um, reputation. Um, he's, his interests are still broad, as they should be for someone starting, but one of his particular interests is the hip. Um, so it's going to be good to hear what he has to say about um, the pediatric hip. Thank you for those uh, kind words, Mohammed. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Ishan Sparoop. I have, I've had the pleasure to meet many of you in, in person, but I look forward to meeting the rest of you um, post-COVID. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank you for giving me this opportunity this morning to talk to you, as well as um, thank you for welcoming me to this department. Um, so this morning, I will be talking to you about what's new in pediatric hip with a specific focus on recent advancements and application to clinical practice. Now, even though we're talking about a specific joint, um, I do think this is a very broad topic. And I'm hopeful that some of the concepts and topics we'll discuss today will be relevant to your practice as well. So I have no relevant disclosures uh, to this talk. So my objective today is to really provide you with an overview of some of the most impactful studies that have been published in the last five years um, on the topic of pediatric hip. Um, I'll also try to highlight some of my own research interests and research projects that I have done in residency and fellowship and also to highlight studies that we are now currently doing at UCSF to try to answer some of these questions. Now, in, in order to kind of answer this or to review this topic in an hour, um, you know, I decided to focus our discussion today on what I consider to be the big four topics in pediatric hip. And these are development dysplasia of the hip, neuromuscular hip, slip capital femoral epiphysis, and then left calf Perthes disease. Now, each one of these topics could be an hour long talk. So we'll try to really hit on the high points and some of the more controversial areas of each of these topics so that we can try to figure out how do we apply this to clinical practice. So for example, for DDH, we'll talk about some of the recent advances that have been made in intraoperative and postoperative imaging. We'll also try to talk about treatments and how do we reduce the risk of osteonecrosis in the setting of closed or open reduction for DDH. We'll also talk a little bit about understanding outcomes, especially long-term outcomes, because that's a big part of patient counseling uh, whenever we see uh, an infant with DDH. For neuromuscular hip, we'll talk about advances in surveillance. Um, this is a hot topic in pediatric orthopedics, as well as talk about surgical management and outcomes because the population that gets neuromuscular hip conditions is very different from our usual pediatric population. For SCIFI, we'll talk about advances in treatment, specifically as it relates to unstable SCIFI and define risk factors for the development of contralateral SCIFI. And for Perthes, we'll focus mostly on imaging since that seems to be really guiding our prognosis um, and management schemas. So we'll first talk about DDH. So as many of you know, development dysplasia of the hip is a spectrum of abnormalities that ranges from dysplasia to subluxation to dislocation. The risk factors, evaluation, and early treatment have been well established and they're outlined in this algorithm shown on the, on the slide. In general, the way I think about this is that there are three outcomes of early treatment for DDH. One is a well-reduced hip that just needs surveillance. The second is a failure of a padlock harness or an abduction brace, which then needs a closed or open reduction. And the third is reduction in a pavlic, but residual dysplasia. And the studies that have been done on DDH have really talked about these potential um, outcomes of DDH. So today we'll focus on how do we reduce the risk of osteonecrosis in kids that are undergoing open or closed reduction? How do we assess intraoperative reduction? And how do we um, use postoperative imaging to guide our decision making for assessing risk for um, complications of reduction? We'll also step back and look at some epidemiological studies looking at rates of reduction in the US, as well as risk for subsequent surgery 
And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the residual dysplasia topic, since that is a very interesting topic and has some relevance to um, a lot of us who see um, young adults with hip problems. So reducing the risk of osteonecrosis, why is this important? Well, it's a real problem. Um, the risk of osteonecrosis after closed or open reduction, the rates vary in the literature, but they've been reported to be as high as 25 to 60% in some of the series. Now it's important to note that not all osteonecrosis is the same, and it's a spectrum. So these rates, while they're high, there is a spectrum that they uh, um, are describing. The risk of osteonecrosis has most recently been thought to be related to two factors. One is the timing of reduction, and the other is the approach to reduction. And so let's first talk a little bit about timing. The discussion of timing relates to the presence or absence of the ossific nucleus. Uh, some authors have theorized that there is a relationship between the presence of the ossific nucleus and a decreased risk of osteonecrosis at the time of reduction. The thought here is that if you have an ossific nucleus or the ossification of the proximal femur, then theoretically you do have more robust vasculature to the femoral head, and as a result, it can withstand the closed and open reduction without leading to osteonecrosis. However, some authors have advocated that the presence or absence of an ossific nucleus is just a sign of severity of the dysplasia and really has no bearing on the risk of osteonecrosis. In fact, delaying treatment or waiting for the ossific nucleus to occur before doing a reduction may lead to a more difficult reduction and even necessitate additional procedures such as a femoral osteotomy or a pelvic osteotomy. So to really get to the bottom of this debate, there have been two meta-analyses that have been published within the past three years, uh, both a few months within each other. The first one was published from the Great Ormond Street in the UK, and the second one was published by some of my mentors in residency at Special Surgery. And both of them came to the same conclusion, which was that there was no relationship between the presence of, of the ossific nucleus and a protective effect against osteonecrosis. And this was for all grades of osteonecrosis and both for closed and open reduction. So the way I think about this in my practice is that, you know, I, I find that I don't really use the ossific nucleus to guide my timing for reduction. I think the objective is still to get the hip in early as long as you balance the risks of the anesthesia with the, um, with the procedure but I do use the ossific nucleus postoperatively to see how the hip is developing after the reduction. The other issue, the other topic that people have looked at in terms of how do we reduce this risk of osteonecrosis is surgical approach. And this, this um, discussion has been going on for a very long time. You know, classically, there are two approaches that have been described to doing uh, an open hip reduction. One is an anterior approach and the other is a medial approach. The medial approach has been theorized by some to have a higher rate of AVN uh, due to the risk of due to iatrogenic risk of injury to the medial femoral circumflex vessels. However, in a, in a recent meta-analysis that was done, there really was no difference in the rate of osteonecrosis between anterior and medial approaches. Anecdotally, people across the world do medial approaches routinely. For example, in Europe, it's, it's done quite commonly. And then when I was a fifth year resident, I spent a month in Melbourne, and all of the open reductions that were done in Melbourne were done, were done medial. So clearly it does work um, and surgeon experience probably plays a role in the risk of osteonecrosis. One of the more interesting studies that was published recently was that uh, they looked at long-term outcomes of a medial approach and they did find that about one in five children that had a medial approach had poor radiographic and clinical outcomes due to persistent dysplasia. Not necessarily osteonecrosis, but persistent dysplasia. So in terms of the discussion of anterior versus medial, I think there's a lot more to be learned here just beyond osteonecrosis. I think we do need some more comparative studies, some prospective studies to see how these children do um, uh, long term. The next area of research in DDH that has generated a lot of discussion um, is how do we assess reduction? So intraoperatively, as many of you know, when we do a closed or open reduction, we use fluoroscopy. Um, to assess our reduction, but there are many issues with that. One of the issues is oftentimes we do an arthrogram and some of our parameters um, use, you know, use millimeter measurements and our fluoroscopy is not calibrated. The other issue is that you're oftentimes imaging through a spica cast and so you end up with an image, the top image you see there, that's one of my patients that I did an open reduction on a few months ago. And yes, you can make, generally make out where the femur is and the pelvis is, but it definitely doesn't give you as much clarity as you would want um, coming out of the operating room. So as a result, some people have wondered whether it's worth doing intraoperative imaging, whether this is intraoperative CT or intraoperative 3D fluoroscopy, kind of borrowing on the concept of our um, spine surgery colleagues who are using more and more intraoperative navigation and uh, CT-guided uh, imaging. So there have been really two big studies that have been done on this. One of them 
has shown that CT, in fact, is equivalent to MRI in assessing reduction, even in young children. There are certain um, parameters and lines that can, that can be drawn and assessed. Um, and in fact, the sensitivity and specificity of a CT is comparable uh, to that of an MRI. Another study was done which looked at 3D fluoroscopy compared to postoperative MRI. And again, they found 3D fluoroscopy intraoperatively was equivalent to MRI. Now, CT is faster and cheaper. However, there are some downsides. One is um, obviously there's a risk of radiation to a young infant in the pelvis. Um, and the other is there is some scatter, especially if you're doing a, for example, a femoral shortening osteotomy, um, then there will be some scatter which may distort your images. In my practice right now in, in Oakland, um, we are using what we call a rapid MRI sequence. And so oftentimes, so what we do is after these children have their reduction in the operating room, they're taken over to the MRI suite, they're extubated, taken over to the MRI suite, and a rapid MRI is done, which takes less than five minutes for some select sequences. And then we have a and then we can make our decision whether the reduction is adequate or not. Now, even though um, you know it's you do have to wake up the child um, and bring them back if uh, if the um, the reduction is inadequate, but it's it's at least gives you uh, rapid decision making. We are trying our we are trying to see if we can bring intraoperative CT, and I think that will definitely help, um, especially for cases which are revision cases or cases that um, you know uh, require uh, more um, rapid decision making. The other area in imaging for DDH that has gained a lot of popularity or a lot of discussion is the role of perfusion MRI. Um, specifically, about a decade ago, there was a study out of Boston Children's uh, which showed that globally decreased enhancement after reduction, um, they, they, well, they summarized globally decreased enhancement may be predictive of postoperative osteonecrosis. However, if you read the paper, it only predicted osteonecrosis in about 50% of the cases. More recently, there have been studies out of CHOP which have um, looked at uh, perfusion MRIs after closed reduction. And what they found is that every patient that had normal perfusion after a closed reduction did not develop uh, osteonecrosis. However, again, if you look at the results really closely though, seven patients in that series had asymmetric enhancement and only one out of those seven developed osteonecrosis. So the way I interpret this data is that it's not an all or nothing. Um, you know, it's not that if you, have, if you have perfusion on your MRI, you don't get osteonecrosis, and if you don't, you do. Um, there is a little bit of a gray area. And so some of the issues that, you know, last year as a fellow at CHOP that um, I saw in person are that, you know, we still need to figure out the uh, relevance of asymmetric enhancement. You know, does the femoral head perfusion vary based on when you do the perfusion MRI, whether it's five minutes after the child wakes up from anesthesia versus 45 minutes? Um, does hypotension affect hip perfusion? And so there are a couple of areas that need to be worked out before I think um, perfusion MRI really becomes a standard of care. In my practice, I just use the axial cuts to assess my reduction. And what I'm doing is I'm basically assessing to see where um, the position of the spica cast and assessing my degrees of abduction, because that is one thing I do know is that if we do excessively abduct the hip, um, that probably is a risk factor for development of osteonecrosis. So I think, again, this is exciting uh, research, um, but more to come before we start to adopt, adopt this into our, our regular practice. The third area in DDH is really relates to patient counseling and epidemiology. And so this is a study that uh, we did um, a few years ago in which we looked at, you know, what are the rates of closed and open reduction throughout the US? And are these changing over time? And what we found, as you can see in the graph, is that you know, the, the, in, the rates of open reduction are actually relatively stable over time, but the rates of closed reduction are increasing. And this suggests to us that some of our surveillance and screening programs are working. And so the efforts that uh, you know, um, professional organizations like the AAP are doing to promoting screening um, may be um, effective um, in, in, in shuttling these patients over to see us. We also looked to see how many of these children actually needed a subsequent surgery after their index closed or open reduction, because this is a really important discussion point that um, with families prior to an open or a closed reduction. And we found that about 33 to 40% of these children needed some kind of subsequent procedure at a median follow-up of nine years. Now, having said that, I think there's an asterisk that's needed here. And that is, you know, this is a database study. And so in all database studies, we do make some assumptions in the data. And one of them is obviously laterality. And so we did a sensitivity analysis um, for this data. And the numbers that I've quoted here and numbers I actually use in practice are the worst case scenario. Um, and so again, the take home points here are that, you know, the risk is real um, and potentially could be quite high. 
The last area I'd like to focus on for DDH is this idea of residual dysplasia. Um, and so this is defined as an acetabular index greater than 30 degrees in a child, uh, in a child six months of age. And this is really kind of a sequela of DDH. Um, and this actually might be the group that we see later on in adolescence that presents with adolescence acetabular dysplasia, hip pain, and labral issues. Now, uh, traditionally, um, this type of um, dysplasia is treated with an abduction orthosis, but the literature guiding our treatment has been very poor. In fact, um, there's only been one retrospective study which has looked at the use of abduction bracing for residual acetabular dysplasia. And while, they did, uh, while the study did suggest efficacy, it did not prove causality. And that's where this, this upper graph comes from, which again shows that the braced cohort did well, or did, had an improvement in acetabular index, um, relative to a, a cohort that was not braced. And so we decided to take this a step further and study this in a prospective manner. So essentially what we did is we took eye button thermal sensors, which are kind of the same thermal sensors that were used to prove the efficacy of bracing for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. We put those into these abduction braces and monitored patients over time to see whether um, wearing the brace had any effect in acetabular index. And sure enough, um, we did find a dose-dependent relationship between the degree of improvement in acetabular index and the hours of brace wear per day. And that's shown in the graph in the bottom. Now, to me, this, this data is actually really interesting and very helpful. First of all, it gives me more confidence when I'm recommending an abduction brace uh, for a child with acetabular dysplasia. And it also gives me a way to rationalize how many hours I'm recommending brace wear. So a child who has more severe residual dysplasia, I'm likely to re recommend more hours in the brace versus a child who has um, more mild acetabular dysplasia. So we'll switch gears into um, a totally different topic, which is neuromuscular hip. Now, oftentimes people talk about this as neuromuscular hip dysplasia, but for the residents, I'd like to say that, you know, DDH is very much different from neuromuscular hip dysplasia. In neuromuscular hip conditions, the, the fundamental problem is that we have persistence of fetal alignment, which, um, which is essentially excessive femoral antiversion and coxivalga. This leads to progressive hip subluxation, uh, which in many ways is, is um, directly correlated uh, with, the, with the child's functional status. So this uh, graph on the bottom right um, is from a landmark study published by Kerr Graham, uh, I think over a decade ago now, uh, which shows that the risk of progressive hip sub subluxation is increased with more functional um, issues. So for example, a child that's GMFCS5 um, and is less functional has a much higher risk of hip subluxation versus a child who is uh, more functional. Our treatment for this is usually a proximal femoral osteotomy so that we can maintain hip production, but in cases that are missed or present late, salvage, oper salvage uh, procedures are considered. The recent studies on neuromuscular hip have really focused on two big areas. One is hip surveillance. How do we capture these children early? How do we monitor them so that we don't have to progress to salvage operations? And the other is how do we improve our surgical management all the way from surgical instrumentation to correction as well as perioperative management to, risk, to decrease the risk of morbidity in this otherwise medically fragile population. In a recent editorial by John Davids from the Shriners Hospital in, in Sacramento, John Davids said that in the last 25 years, there have really been only two significant advancements in the care of children with cerebral palsy. One is the development of a classification system, and the other is the development of hip surveillance. And I would admit that you know, other countries do it much better than we do here. Uh, so programs for hip surveillance have, have existed for a long time in Europe, Australia, and Canada, and have been shown to be successful um, in capturing um, patients with progressive hip subluxation. Uh, a recent POSNA survey also found that over 90% of orthopedic surgeons want to surveil this program. And so as a result, the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine has come up with a care pathway, uh, which essentially provides uh, practitioners with an algorithm of how to follow these patients. It's based on the factors that we've kind of already touched on, which are patient age, their functional level, and their migration percentage, or how much their hip is subluxed at presentation. And it's also been incorporated into the hip, hip surveillance or the hip screen app, which I think we touched upon last week. And so in my practice, the hip screen app has been a real game changer for me. I think I, I use it quite a bit to reference, um, you know, um, algorithm as an, algorithms and also to access the care pathway because it provides me with some some method uh, behind the madness. For surgical management, like I mentioned, there have been um, some advancements and some research that's been done both from surgical technique point of view and also from perioperative management. And so this is one of the studies that we did um, looking at biomechanics of some of the implants we use um, in children undergoing um, femoral varus osteotomies. 
And so um, blade plates have really become the fixed angle uh, construct of choice for a lot of pediatric orthopedic surgeons in doing proximal femoral osteotomies. And there are many on the market. And so what we decided to do was to really compare two of the most commonly used blade plates on the market to see whether one, one was um, superior to the other in biomechanical testing. And so we put this through axial loading. And sure enough, we did find that one of the blade plates, which in this case was blade plate B, uh, was superior to blade plate A um, in terms of the axial load it was able to withstand before, before um, our defined failure. We also looked to see, you know, oftentimes these blade, plate, these blade plates are cannulated and they come with an inserter, which is a threaded hole. Oftentimes when we take the inserter out, we put a locking screw through that um, hole into the proximal fragment. And so one of the questions I had was, you know, we put these locking screws in all the time, does it really make a difference? Or are we just adding, you know, an extra couple of minutes um, and using up some um, healthcare dollars uh, in doing this? And so we did, we checked pullout strength and whether that changes with this proximal screw and it does. And, and in fact, uh, putting in the proximal screw does de increase the pullout strength of the blade by a factor of 12, which again, um, was very um, helpful. Um, and so in my practice, you know, I do use this data to, to inform what kind of implants I use um, and to, to make a decision on, on what would be best because implants at the end of the day uh, most likely do have some implications to early weight bearing and range of motion uh, for these patients. Another study we did was looking at derotation and how do we assess derotation intraoperatively. So as I already mentioned, one of the fundamental issues in neuromuscular hip dysplasia is excessive femoral antiversion. And we're oftentimes trying to correct this intraoperatively as well. Now it's somewhat, you know, the rotational profile in the office is one thing, but assessing rotation in the operating room after an osteotomy is done is another, and it's quite challenging. And some of the traditional ways we would do this is by using a goniometer or a, a triangle osteotomy template. But oftentimes, have, you know, doing these cases as a resident, a fellow, I'd always wonder, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity and a lot of um, inter-observer um, differences in the way we assess rotation. And so one of the things we wondered was, you know, an inclinometer, which is a basic instrument that is used in construction to measure tilt, could we use this to improve our accuracy and our precision in doing this? And, and so what we did is we did a sawbone study, and sure enough, we did find that an electronic inclinometer was more accurate uh, than the other two um, techniques in doing derotation osteotomies. And as you can see in the table, um, it was actually more accurate for larger corrections. So corrections that were 30 degrees versus 15 degrees, um, it really started to show um, that it was more effective in those larger corrections. Now, I do use this in practice as well. Um, I sometimes will um, use a cell phone in a sterile bag or an inclinometer in a sterile bag, uh, put two K wires proximal and distal and measure derotation that way. Um, and you know, some people may argue though, does it really matter? You know, does three, five degrees, does that matter? And that was one of the most common um, comments we got when this article was being published. Um, and my rebuttal to that was, well, you know, our arthroplasty colleagues really care about distal femoral rotation when they're putting in their total knee implant because it has implications for patellar tracking. And I really don't see what the difference would be here. Um, you know, and so I think um, trying to get as accurate as possible is important. And it's also relevant to other subspecialties too, including trauma, where you know femoral malunions and derotation osteotomies, um, getting the getting that correct is is really important. For the perioperative management, one of the biggest issues with femoral osteotomies in children with cerebral palsy or neuromuscular conditions is blood loss, and so antifibrinolytic agents are really in vogue right now in orthopedic surgery, and they've been shown to be um, efficacious in arthroplasty and as well as pediatric and adult spine surgery. And um, in a recent meta-analysis, we also found that it was effective in pediatric patients. But a lot, the majority of studies that were done in this population, though, uh, were done for pediatric spinal deformity. So one of the things we uh, wanted to look at is, um, is whether antifibrinolytic agents are effective in decreasing blood loss and transfusion requirements for kids undergoing bilateral various rotational osteotomies. And so bilateral osteotomies, like I mentioned, have a significant amount of blood loss. Um, the reports in the literature are all the way from 400 cc's to upwards of a liter, which you can imagine if you look at, if you think of that as percent blood volume loss, that's quite a bit for a pediatric patient, especially a patient that is, you know, in their age range of five to 10. And so we performed a prospective double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. And essentially what we found was that there was no difference in blood loss um, and transfusion requirements between both groups. And there are a couple of reasons why I think we found this. One is um, we used aminocaparoic acid um, in this study instead of using translexamic acid. And that was done primarily uh, because of the, um, the risk profile of TXA in patients uh, with cerebral palsy. 
And the other is that, you know, children are very different. They have um, a developmental hemostasis that is protect protective against bleeding as well as protective against clotting. And same reason why we don't uh, routinely use DVT prophylaxis in children. And so that may um, play a role. And also, osteotomies are fundamentally a different procedure than a total joint arthroplasty in which you're closing the capsule, having a tamponade effect. In osteotomies, you're leaving bone ends exposed. Um, there's a much larger potential space. Um, and so those could all be factors why, you know, why we saw no effect. Outside of that, from just taking a step back from a research point of view, um, this study was extremely formative for me from a research point of view because this is the first time that I helped to kind of design a prospective study. And it kind of pointed out to me um, the major issues that we see with randomized control trials and surgery. And these include variations in surgeon practice, um, you know, variations in the types of procedures, um, and also issues with our primary outcomes sometimes in surgical procedures, measuring blood loss. I mean, we used a, we try to use an objective um, measurement of this based on the anesthesia literature, but again, there's no perfect way to measure that. Um, so um, the lesson I learned here is that, you know, I don't necessarily use antifibrinolytic agents um, in these cases, but it was more so for me is from a research point of view is thinking about how do we do these um, studies in a randomized manner in surgery. So uh, now we'll switch gears into a, kind of a topic that um, a lot of us see um, either in children or even kids who present later or adults who present later, and that's slip capital femoral epiphysis. So um, as a summary, SCIFI is defined as a slippage of the proximal femoral metaphysis relative to the epiphysis. And the way I think about this is that essentially it's mechanical forces on a susceptible physis. Um, just like most things in pediatric orthopedic, there is a range of severity. And so um, you can have a stable stiffy, which is characterized by a child is able to bear weight and has a lower risk of osteonecrosis. And then you can have unstable stiffy, which in which a child is unable to bear weight and has a much higher risk of osteonecrosis, up to actually 47% is kind of the original um, rate that uh, uh, Loder had quoted in his original description of this. Now, the studies on SCIFI have really focused on three major areas. One is, how do we manage the unstable SCIFI? Because like I mentioned right now, you know, we know the rates of osteonecrosis are very high in this population, and the risk of proximal femoral later on developing proximal femoral deformity is also very high. So how do we manage this well? So that's been one area. The other has been, how do we assess in, uh, hip perfusion intraoperatively? Again, the, the name of the game here is perfusion. And so how do we leave the operating room being confident that the hip is well perfused? And the third is, um, how do we assess the risk for subsequent contralateral SCIFI? Um, some authors think of SCIFI as actually a disease instead of just a disorder affecting a hip. And so there is a risk of uh, contralateral SCIFI. And so how can we really identify patients that are at risk for a contralateral slip so that we can provide them with prophylactic fixation and adequate counseling? So unstable SCIFI, I think it's fair to say that management is still um, somewhat controversial and debated. Uh, the conventional treatment for this was uh, minimal reduction with in situ fixation. And the rates of ABN um, with this were actually not, not terrible. Um, you know, they were better than the original 47%. They were kind of more in the low teens, uh, but still not that great. Um, since then, there's been kind of an evolution in, in how, how we have thought about the management of unstable Skippy. Um, uh, Klaus Parch published a paper uh, back in 2009 in which he described his way of doing this, which was essentially a Watson-Jones open reduction, uh, a capsule decompression, a fingertip reduction, and smooth wire fixation. You can see that on the illustration um, above. You know, he makes it look very easy, and I, I would have to say that it's not so easy just to just get an index finger on the head and get it reduced. Uh, but his, his ABN rates were actually quite impressive, um, impressively low. Uh, they were about 4.7% in his original description. However, we don't have um, many other studies that have replicated this, and so um, while, you know, in, in theory, this makes sense. I think it does need a little bit more investigation. Another uh, approach that is um, gaining popularity is this um, idea of close reduction and perfusion monitoring. And this kind of draws upon um, the way we have traditionally done close reduction for femoral neck fractures and also draws a little bit upon what Parsh talks about in his, um, in his paper, where you actually manipulate the leg in order to perform a close reduction and then uh, perform fixation. Um, we don't really know the rates of ABN with this approach um, because there haven't been very good um, studies that have uh, specifically looked at this um, outcome, especially, especially with perfusion monitoring. Uh, but I'm sure these studies are coming down the pike since this is gaining um, some popularity nationally. The uh, approach that has really uh, gained a lot of traction in the last, I would say, um, 
10 to 15 years is the modified done procedure. So this is um, essentially where we would do a, a capital realignment through a surgical hip dislocation. We would identify and preserve the retinacular vessels and do a controlled reduction. The largest study published on this was published in JBJS about four years ago, um, which was quite humbling. And it actually uh, showed that the AVN rates were still about 26% uh, with a modified done procedure. Now, you may argue that that's better than, the, you know, than doing nothing and having a 47% rate, but still 26% is quite high. And in fact, there have been several studies that have been published since then, which have been more single center, single surgeon, which have shown AVN rates to be more around five or 6%. So just like anything else in hip preservation surgery, I think this again underscores the fact that uh, places that do this often, and surgeons that do this often, uh, we do tend to get better as we do this procedure. Now, how, do these, how does the modified done do long-term? Well, um, you know, this was described um, out of the group in Switzerland and, and they have now presented um, their 10-year data on modified done osteotomies. And what they found is that the risk of AVM that they reported was about 5% and about 86% survivorship at 10 years. And this was for a patient that presented with a severe slip, so a slip greater than 60 degrees. So again, you know, not perfect outcomes, but that's, that's pretty, pretty good uh, for a bad problem. In general though, you know, as I've kind of tried to highlight throughout this discussion is that comparative studies are needed. You know, there are many ways to do this. And I think what we really need to do is to study this scientifically um, so that we can figure out, you know, um, there is a lot of variability and so we can figure out, you know, what is the kind of the optimal way to manage an unstable CAP and a severe CAP. Assessing hip perfusion. Now this, um, as I alluded to, has really been gaining some traction. So this is a, a great study done by uh, Tim Schrader out of um, Atlanta in which he essentially take an, takes an IC, ICP probe, um, places it through the cannulated screw, and looks for a pulsatile waveform, which is, which is supposed to be synchronous with the heart rate of the patient. And what he found is that all patients, um, and he looked at both stable and unstable skippies, and what he found is patients that had a pulsatile waveform with the ICP probe, none of them developed AVN. He did have six patients in his cohort, which had an unstable skippy, which did not have a pulsatile waveform, and then he did a capsular decompression using a Cobb elevator, and, he did and then he had return of pulsatile flow. Now, that's all great, but the one thing, the glaring weakness of the study was that, you know, this, they don't really talk about what happens when you don't get flow. So if you don't get synchronous flow, what happens if you do a couch decompression, you still don't get a synchronous flow, what are the implications of that? Um, and so that is something that, um, that still needs to be worked out. So the way I think about intraoperative perfusion monitoring, it's something that I'm not doing routinely right now um, in practice is that it's similar to the perfusion MRI for, the, for DDH. I think it's great technology, uh, it makes intuitive sense, but there are a couple of uh, pathways that you can take which still need to be figured out uh, before we start to use this uh, in a more widespread manner. The last area for Skiffy that is kind of uh, interesting um, and something that has been kind of a personal research, research interest of mine is you know, assessing the risk of subsequent contralateral Skiffy. Um, the risk of uh, contralateral Skiffy after unilateral Skiffy is actually quite high. Um, and actually the prevalence of it has been reported in the literature to range from 20 to 80%. Prophylactic fixation is considered um, in many cases, but prophylactic fixation is not a benign procedure. And there are many complications associated with that, including avascular necrosis, uh, chondrolysis, peri-implant fracture. Uh, there were two decision analyses that were published kind of in the early 2000s, uh, both within a few years of each other in JBJS. And they came to different conclusions. One advocated for prophylactic fixation and one advocated against. So clearly, uh, this is an area that needs additional research so that we can provide some evidence-based um, uh, guidelines um, to provide some uh, good clinical decision-making. So the first question I wanted to answer is, well, if the rate's 20 to 80 percent, it can't be that, that broad. And so what we decided to do is we decided to look at, you know, what are the rates of contralateral skippy in the United States? And for this, uh, we use this um, database called the Pediatric Health Information System which draws data from um, 49 children's hospitals throughout the country. And we looked at a 12 year period uh, to see how many patients that present with a unilateral skiffy ended up presenting with a contralateral skiffy. And we found that the rate of a contralateral skiffy was about 11%. Um, older children seem to have a lower risk of a subsequent contralateral skip, uh, slip. And the majority of slips, uh, contralateral slips presented within, within 18 months of the first slip. So to me, um, this, started, this does provide me some good uh, data for clinical practice. And so one of the things that I look at is obviously patient age, because that, um, you know, and you can say that maybe that's compounded by skeletal maturity, but as a proxy, that's an important measure. Uh, 
Um, and then the other is the 18 months. So when I'm seeing a child with a unilateral stiffy and I'm following them, I'm really looking very, very carefully at their other hip um, for the, at least for the first 18 months, uh, if not until scalable maturity to make sure that they don't develop a contralateral slip. The next question that we asked from this was, well, which risk factors are the strongest predictors of a subsequent contralateral slip? And so this is where we did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of demographic, clinical, and radiographic risk factors. And what we found in our meta-analysis was that younger age at time of index stiffy and a higher posterior slopic angle of the unaffected hip at the time of index presentation uh, were both significantly different and predictive. And so this goes back to the whole idea of um, skeletal immaturity and having uh, mechanical forces against the susceptible physis. Those are probably two of the major factors um, that are important um, in determining risk. So then we took this one step further, which is, can we develop a prediction model to see which patients, uh, what to really quantify risk and to predict which patients will develop a contralateral slip? And so we took those uh, parameters that we had identified in our systematic review and applied them to a cohort of patients that presented with a unilateral slip. And the three factors that we found to be predictive of a contralateral slip were a younger age, a lower modified Oxford score, and a lower difference in epiphyseal diaphyseal angle between both hips, which is the conventional southward angle. And then we solved the regression equation and found that if you had all three of these risk factors, your risk of a contralateral slip was about 73%. And if you had none of these risk factors, your risk of a contralateral slip were about 2%. Now this uh, for me is very helpful in practice because this is when I'm seeing a patient um, who's been admitted with a, a stable slip. And if I look at all these three risk factors, if all three are present, you know, my um, recommendation is very different from when these risk factors are not present. However, um, it is important to, to recognize that this data is based on a retrospective study. And so uh, the next step for us taking this data is to validate this in a prospective manner using a prospective uh, cohort. So this is where some study groups come into play. And so this is a, a new study group that's been formed. It's called, it's appropriately called SLIP, the Skiffy Longitudinal International Prospective Registry. It's based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and essentially a study group um, that has been created um, to put together an international multi-center database of Skiffy patients. And um, what we're doing is we're putting all of our patients, stable slips, unstable slips, treated in all different ways into a prospective registry and following them. And our goal here is you know, that we can hopefully use this data to compare treatments, identify risk factors for contralateral Skiffy, and even look at long-term outcomes. So, you know, the post skiffy deformity patients um, and see what kind of treatments would be ideal for them. Uh, we are an active member of this group now and we've actually enrolled about seven patients and I think they have a little over hundred. So, so we have been um, very um, busy and productive uh, and, and a valuable member. And uh, again, if anybody has any interest in skiffy related research, uh, please definitely reach out to me. I think we should have some good data within the next six to 12 months uh, that we can start to analyze. For just for the last few minutes here, um, I will uh, touch upon Perthes disease. So Perthes disease is a idiopathic avascular necrosis of the proximal femoral epiphysis. Um, and this is a very perplexing condition. And I think that's an understatement. You know, we know that Perthes happens uh, reliably through a couple of stages. And those are shown at the bottom where you have an initial stage followed by fragmentation, followed by reossification, and then the healed phase. Um, however, I would say that in the uh, in the schematic shown, the healed phase makes it look very ideal. Oftentimes, uh, the the hip at the at the time it's healed does not look like that, and there is a lot of proximal femoral deformity um, that does happen with Perthes disease. And so, a lot of um, you know our classification systems and prognostic factors have been well established, and a lot of this work has been done by Herring and the group at Texas Scottish Rite. But a lot of the recent research has focused on imaging modalities and how imaging can really inform our classification our prognosis and our treatment for patients with Perthes. Um, some of the more recent re research has also talked about management and treatment. You know, what are the roles of bracing and casting in these patients? What are the roles of uh, femoral and pelvic osteotomy? And so I'll briefly touch upon these uh, in the next couple of slides. So for imaging, the prognosis of Perthes disease is dictated by what we call the Heron classification or the pillar classification. Uh, and in a nutshell, this all has to do with the lateral pillar height. If the lateral pillar height is maintained, typically these children do well. If the lateral pillar height is not maintained, these children tend to do poorly, especially if they're older in age. Um, some have argued that since prognosis is based on plain x-rays in this pillar classification, which we actually define during the fragmentation phase, 
are we delaying treatment because you know they go through children go through this whole initial phase without having a, a classification assigned to them and maybe we're mi missing a window where we should be acting on these children and so um, a perfusion MRI this is where perfusion MRI plays a, a very important role so the question becomes if we can predict stage early on in the disease course could we more aggressively treat the pillar B and C groups, the ones that are, have a poor prognosis in the early parts of disease. And so um, perfusion MRI studies have now been done for patients that present at the time of um, initial diagnosis. And these perfusion MRIs have shown that the percent perfusion of the lateral third of the epiphysis does seem to be predictive of the lateral pillar involvement during mid-fragmentation. And that's what's shown here on this uh, graph in the bottom. And so um, this is, again, something that I am starting to use in my practice. So when I'm seeing a new child, uh, a new consul for a Perthes disease, I am obtaining a perfusion MRI because it does show, give me a little bit of insight as to um, how severe is the disease course going to be. And it also helps me to think about how, um, how actively am I going to be um, advocating for aggressive treatment for this child. The authors from this original study, which was done through the International Protein Study Group, have taken it a step further and been like, well, if we're using initial perfusion MRI, should we be using serial perfusion MRIs to see whether that has any role in letting us figure out when can a child start to bear weight or um, you know, how is their prognosis changing? And these studies have shown a few things. They've shown, one, that the reperfusion that happens in the epiphysis does happen in a reliable manner. And the other is there is a rate of reperfusion, which is, um, which, you know, which in their study, I believe was about 5% per month, but it's variable. And so um, those are some of the things that I find um, from just a data point, a point of view are helpful when I talk to patients, but I still don't think a serial perfusion MRI um, really does change your management because oftentimes you're, you're basing your recommendations off of symptoms. Um, and so perfusion MRI, even though again, it has provided some valuable information, I think, again, maybe more of a research tool than a clinical tool at this time. Treatment. Well, treatment really depends on the principles of, principles of management for Perthes disease. And in, in Perthes, you know, the, the name, the kind of the major principles are offloading the hip during fragmentation phase, maintaining hip motion so that the head stays spherical, and containing the hip um, in the acetabulum so, again, the hip stays spherical. There are many ways to do this. And so one of the ways that has been described is uh, there's this uh, nice paper by Perry Schoeniker uh, from St. Louis in which he advocates for doing adequate tenotomy, cylinder casting, which is kind of the traditional petri casting, which has been around for a long time, followed by bracing. And he presented his data from 25 years of doing this. And, you know, surprisingly, it, it, it is quite good and quite impressive in terms of the results that he's been able to accomplish. He basically shows for um, pillar A, so these are the ones that have a good lateral pillar height, they all do very well. You know, they're able to maintain their motion. They have a, um, a, a spherical and a congruent head. But even the Bs and Cs do relatively well. Um, and a lot of the, the majority of them actually do uh, remain some sphericity in their head and maintain a congruent reduction. And now, I do think that it is probably overkill to do this in every single patient. And so for me, the indications for doing a petri cast and or A-frame brace and the images on the bottom left are a, an image from a patient that I did this for recently, is a patient that starts to lose motion. So if a patient is starting to lose abduction related to their disease, those are ones that I would like to maintain their motion. And then on x-ray, if I'm starting to see any early signs of lateral extrusion, or if I'm starting to see that containment is becoming an issue, this will kind of be my first approach um, uh, to the management. Uh, you know, more, it obviously preserves, it helps to preserve their motion, but it also gives me some information because I oftentimes will do an arthrogram and that will provide me some dynamic information about what's going on with the, um, the shape of the femoral head. The more traditional uh, treatment for Perthes has been proximal femoral osteotomy, and this has been around for a long time. And the thought here is that through a proximal femoral osteotomy, you can uh, provide containment of the femoral head, you can alter the mechanics. Uh, that the hip is seeing, and then you can also maybe promote some reparative biology and promote healing or reossification. Initially, some thoughts, some, some authors said that a proximal osteotomy actually helped to bypass fragmentation altogether, but a more recent study, again, through the Perthes study group has shown that it doesn't necessarily help you bypass fragmentation, it just probably decreases the amount of time a child spends in fragmentation. And then what happens, though, to these patients long-term, and there was a, a nice study out of Israel um, that was published in JBJS, which has uh, some relevance to our, to our arthroplasty colleagues, which showed that at an average follow-up of about 40 years after proximal femoral osteotomy for Perthes disease, only about 17% of these patients um, needed a total, total arthroplasty. 
Now, um, those are actually pretty encouraging results, but it's important to realize that there was no control group. So we don't really know what happens if you don't do a cross femoral osteotomy. Um, and then, you know, again, we do need some better um, comparative data uh, to provide patients with some, uh, some um, adequate counseling. So in a nutshell, I think Perthes has, there are more questions than answers uh, for Perthes disease. And some of the questions that are constantly go through my mind are, you know, what, are, what is the role for early pelvic osteotomy? We've talked about femoral osteotomy for containment. What about doing a, a pelvic osteotomy for containment? And then what is the optimal management for some of the late sequela or some of the things that we see in kids with healed Perthes? So these are things like femoral acetabular impingement, uh, dysplasia, osteochondral lesions. And so there have been a lot of studies uh, that have been published recently in CORE and in JPO, uh, which have looked at this. And a lot of these have been case series and they've shown that there is improvement in motion, there's improvement in outcome scores, at least in the short term with treatment for impingement and osteochondral lesions. But we really don't know how these patients do long term. This is one of my patients that I saw um, a couple of months ago who presented with an osteochondral lesion and impingement for, uh, for whom I did a surgical hip dislocation and um, Neurov did a osteochondral autograft plug. You know, again, from a functional point of view, I'm able to tell him that I, I do think this surgery is going to help him, but I just don't know how this is going to change the natural history of his hip. So how are we answering these questions? And this is where the International Perthes Study Group comes into play. So this is a um, study group that's been established to systematically collect data and guide research. It's a group of surgeons and researchers from, I believe it's about 10 countries, and there's about 30 or 40 of us that are in this group, um, and it's based out of Texas Scottish Rights. Um, and it's, again, a prospective study, prospective registry that's including all patients with Perthes, all the way from kind of the young presentation to the older presentation. And um, we put them through a standard protocol of getting a perfusion MRI initially, but the treatment is very surgeon dependent. And so we're hopeful that, the, that collaborative, study, co collaborative initiatives like this uh, will be helpful in answering some of these uh, difficult questions of, you know, what happens long term to the post protheses deformity? Um, you know, what is the difference between femoral osteotomy versus pelvic osteotomy? Um, and so, again, there's a lot, lot more to come, but I think we're heading in the right direction. So in conclusion, um, there have been several advancements that have been made in the diagnosis, management, and the prevention of pediatric hip disorders but additional research is still needed in a lot of these areas. And so for DDH, that's still you know, reducing the risk of osteonecrosis and defining the use of perfusion MRI. For the neuromuscular hip, this is validating our surveillance programs that we are now starting to use in North America, and also reducing this perioperative and surgical morbidity associated with surgical management in this um, medically complex population. For Skippy, it's comparing our management for unstable Skippy, determining the significance of intraoperative hip perfusion, and predicting contralateral Skippy. And for Perthes, it's essentially comparing strategies for containment and the management of late sequela um, of Perthes. Now, um, even though these conditions are relatively common in our world in pediatric orthopedics, they're, they're pretty rare overall. So I really do think uh, study groups will be integral um, in allowing us to collect quality, high-level data so that we can answer some of these really important questions. So as, our, as my last slide, what are we doing at UCSF? Well, uh, we are doing, we have several ongoing research projects through our study groups and through our databases. We have also recently in, um, uh, unveiled a pediatric hip module um, in code. So this is for our hip preservation patients uh, that are um, undergoing surgical management. So that is now available so that we can collect our own patient data here. Um, you know, one of the most fascinating and, and kind of one of the most intriguing parts of uh, being at an institution like UCSF is the fact that we are a very collaborative institution. And so I've had a tremendous amount of success collaborating with colleagues from sports to limb deformity, arthroplasty, radiology, and I really appreciate um, that collaborative nature that we have here. And then the last is really, um, you know, incorporating these advancements into practice. And so for the last couple of months, a lot of my time and effort has been, has been put into developing protocols for perfusion MRI, protocols for orthotics, and developing an abduction brace. Um, and so I'm hope, you know, I'm encouraged by the progress I've made and I look forward to, to working on these efforts. With that, thank you for your time and um, I'd be happy to take uh, questions. Great, thanks so much. That was uh, an excellent overview, a lot of good information and uh, I think exciting future potential too. Um, anybody have any uh, specific questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, Ishan, this is Sanjeev. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and you know, it just shows that in such a short span of, I guess, your early career, you've achieved so much. Uh, 
And honestly, this is not a question about the hip as it is about, you know, some, some advice for the younger audience here um, in terms of, you know, how, how do you sort of translate intellectual curiosity into doing studies that, you know, have a focus and an impact? So give, uh, give us some tips in terms of how you've managed that and what are the challenges? Sure. Um, that's a great question. I think my thought process has evolved. I think when you start training, you know, you're a kid in a candy store and everything seems very interesting. And so I think um, a couple of ways that I think are important. One is um, it's always it's obviously very important to keep asking questions. And so, I, I, you know, now that I'm in the role as a faculty member and, and an educator, uh, I think I well, you know, I try to encourage the residents to keep asking questions, even questions that um, you know, pertain to the thing that I'm doing, you know, why am I doing something a certain way, um, obviously within reason. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to encourage um, asking questions in the operating room. And, and sometimes, for the re and as a resident, what I would do oftentimes is I would write down questions that I had uh, for a particular case the first time I did it. And then the second time we would do the case, I would think about those questions again, and how did a certain attending do it differently? And then um, really, you know, if there's a question that seems clinically relevant, and for example, uh, the derotation osteotomy technique, that's a good one, you know, how and using an electronic inclinometer, if there's an interesting question that you're like, well, I think there might be a simple solution that's, that could improve our accuracy, then find a faculty member who might be interested in that topic and see if they can help, you know, kind of cultivate that question further um, for you. Um, and then, you know, so I think that's kind of the natural progression of how, for me, taking a question that came up clinically for me, whether it was in the operating room or the clinic, finding a faculty member and then executing that. But I would say that, you know, um, there is a time and place for a lot of these questions. And so some of the research that I did, for example, as a fellow, um, those questions I initially thought of when I was a resident. And oftentimes you kind of have to start to lay down the, gr the groundwork um, so that you can answer questions appropriately um, by kind of working in a sequential manner. So for example, for contralateral stiffy, I knew that we needed to first define a baseline risk. I knew that we needed to do a systematic review. I knew that we needed to do all those things before thinking about the big picture, which is a prediction score. So um, it's important to kind of um, take a step back sometimes from your research and think about the long-term um, you know, projection and timeline. Dr. Vail. Yeah, Ishan, uh, fantastic uh, overview and summary of your work, and uh, I agree with Sanjeev. It's uh, it's very impressive. One uh, point that you made several times, a word that you used that I think is very interesting, is perfusion. And uh, you, you didn't really talk about circulation; you talked about perfusion. And uh, in my own, you know, thoughts about osteonecrosis, you consider whether the absence of perfusion is a consequence of, a, of an underlying issue or um, is it a primary event? And, and as you look at perfusion, how does it uh, relate to the macro circulation? Is there any, any connection? Just, I, I know it's a big subject, but it, briefly, can you give us your, your, your thoughts about uh, blood circulation in the hip and this concept of perfusion? Yeah, thank you for that question, Dr. Bale. Um, I think, you know, um, we've, we didn't go into this today, but um, we've also kind of made in the last, I think, 10 years or so, we've done quite a bit of work on defining the vascularity of the, of the hip. Um, and I think we have a, a pretty good understanding at this point of how that, how the actual, um, from an anatomic point of view, how that works. Now, the question is, um, you know, is the hip like myocardium, right? If you have transient ischemia, um, is that how critical is that to the hip? And that's a question that I think we don't quite know. And that's what I was trying to allude to with these perfusion MRI studies. You know, that's kind of the way, that's a non-invasive way for us to study uh, vascularity to the hip. And the question really becomes is just because you have transient ischemia or transient loss of flow that you're unable to capture on imaging, does that have similar implications to, you know, a myocardial infarction, for example, due to ischemia? So, and, and that I think is um, really where, our, you know, we need to get a bit more clarity. Um, you know, what are the implications of that? And so that is why I'm still a little hesitant to start to use a lot of these um, perfusion MRI sequences, intraoperative perfusion monitoring, uh, 
because I don't quite, and I don't think most of us quite know what are the implications of this, um, this you know, aberrant perfusion or lack of perfusion uh, to the hip long term. I mean, we know that if you obviously cut off the circulation for a long period of time, for example, in a femoral neck fracture, of course, you're going to develop um, avascular necrosis or an unstable skiffy, you're going to develop that. But for these more transient events, we really don't know. And, and also, what, what is transient? You know, is that, are we talking minutes? Are we talking hours? Are we talking days? Um, and again, that is um, where some of the clinical research is starting to be done. And that kind of relates to the whole idea of should we be doing unstable skiffies quickly? Should we be doing them late? Should we be doing femoral neck fractures quickly? Should we, you know, the, the, kind of the, the honeymoon period? Uh, and from a basic science point of view is really defining how um, the femoral head reacts to a lack of perfusion. So um, I think, again, this is another area, more questions than answers, um, but a very uh, interesting area nonetheless. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, Sean, uh, ben Ma, you know, I have a question about um, uh, perfusion MRI. Um, I, I love, you know, uh, you know, imaging as you, as you, um, as we were talking about before. Um, and I, my question is, um, is the perfusion MRI a, a GAD based uh, intravenous injection? And it if it is, um, we have a lot of issue with, um, you know, basically GAD uh, MRI for me because of the issue with the um, GAD, you know, um, effect on the kidney. And also there are a lot of issue about the timing of the injection and also how sensitive the scans are. And namely that you, know, you have to inject it and to wait a certain amount of time. And you actually don't wait long enough, you actually get, you know, very different, you know, imaging quality. Uh, and how is that being controlled in the pediatric population right now, especially it looks like these are younger patients and uh, they may need to get anesthesia to get um, the images done, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Akhmat. So uh, I would say, in a nutshell, it's not being controlled very well. Um, you know, I think uh, we are using gadolinium uh, for these MRIs, and um, you've just kind of highlighted some of the important issues. One is, I think, the timing is very important. So, for example, going back to that DDA chip that I was talking about, um, you know, we were able to do a perfusion MRI actually with a child awake because they're in a spica cast and they're relatively immobile in their pelvis, so it's, they don't necessarily need anesthesia. Uh, but the issue always becomes is timing and um, how does systemic perfusion and, and systemic pressure affect uh, your ability to, to do a good hip perfusion MRI? And so, um, you know, that has, is still a work in progress. And, and I'll just give a quick example. You know, last year as a fellow, we did a case where we did a closed reduction of a hip, took the kid to the MRI scanner. The head was completely black. There was no perfusion. Uh, we repeated the scan just a few hours later because there wasn't any excessive abduction in the, in the, in the cast. There was really no major, you know, Things that would su suggest avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis or signs of osteonecrosis or hypoperfusion. And we did an MRI just a few hours later and then there was perfusion. So clearly, you know, there is um, some variability um, in terms of some several factors at play that determine your sensitivity of your uh, MRI. And then for your question about, you know, repeated gadolinium, um, that is very important. And that's, I didn't go into this, but that's part of my reason why for per children with perthes, I don't see any merit to doing a serial perfusion MRI because clearly gadolinium over and over is probably not great, even for a pediatric kidney, uh, which obviously is probably healthier than, um, you know, um, the uh, kidneys in, in adults. But regardless, I just don't see that um, as being worth the risk. Well, that's great. You know, because, you know, there's a lot of work done on the knee uh, regarding GAD. And I think um, non-contrast imaging modalities may be something that, you know, have some you know, potential um, uh, um, and points of the space. Um, so I think the imaging group at UC is awesome. Okay. Uh, and I would probably, you know, encourage you to kind of, you know, work with the group and I think hopefully find something better um, that actually, you know, able to help some of these patients, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would love to get in touch with them. I mean, we've been starting to think about ultrasound as another way, um, you know, in terms of Doppler flow, but I would love to talk to them and get their thoughts. Yeah. All right. I think uh, we will probably wrap up with that. But um, thanks again, Ishan. This was great. And uh, thank you all for joining. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody.